in a quest to become world champion, Michael Watson's fight with Chris Eubank rocked the boxing world. The pressure of that fight, going into that fight, was immense. Immense. It was fierce. It was ugly. He wanted that title. It's no good being a people's champion. Michael wanted to be a champion. That's my focus, to become world champion. The most controversial fight ever seen in a British ring left Michael Watson fighting for life. This is his story. Dalston is home to one of London's biggest black communities. Sandwiched between trendy Islington and hard-nosed Hackney, it wasn't an easy place to grow up in, particularly if you were a quiet boy like Michael Watson. Michael wasn't always tough. He used to cry too easily, and I couldn't allow him to grow up like that. No way. Michael was very quiet, very shy, you know, so we have to break him, you, I would say break him in, you know. Yes, he was very, very quiet. Naturally shy, Michael found it difficult to cope with life on the rough and ready de Beauvoir estate and soon fell victim to the local bully. Some boy, I don't remember the name, used to beat him up, you know, bullied him. And I always tell him, help yourself, because I can't go and fight for you, so you have to defend yourself. It got to a point where he just went home crying, and then his uncle said, that's enough's enough, you need to learn to box, you need to learn to look after yourself. Uncle Joe took him to the Crown and Manor, a local gym bursting with young boxing hopefuls. For Michael, it was a safe haven away from the harsh realities of East London life. I wanted to make him a man and not just a crime. And he, he came up and I noticed that there was something in him. To Michael, the gym felt like home the moment he stepped inside. Seeing the punch bag for the first time, looking at Boston Glass for the first time, it was truly extraordinary. I just couldn't get, get, I just couldn't wait to put my hands through them. Just get, just to go and smell, smell the leather of the bags. It's truly amazing. Things were coming out gently. Things were coming out, you know, as he got confident, his natural ability started to show. He had good wing craft, he had a good thinking brain, nice jab. Good left hook. Um, yeah, everything clicked. In, in time, everything clicked together. Boxing was me. I was in complete control. And it was only after a few weeks, I, be, I became top man in the club. It wasn't long before Michael stepped into the ring. And as a promising junior, he started to win. Boxing, it takes years and years of hard work. You know, it's not something which you actually can go to the gym and train for, you know, two or three weeks or two and three months. It's a, it's a sacrifice you've got to make over a period of time. From 15, 16, you know, your you, uh, ultimate ambition is to become a champion, but it's a, a long process. It takes a lot of time, a lot of dedication and a lot of preparation. Michael was at the gym three times a week and running six miles a day. By 1984, he moved up the ranks to fight in the Amateur Boxing Association Championships. Having failed to make the finals, Michael decided to leave the amateurs behind and turn professional. There's, I would say, only a percentage of maybe two or three percent that actually make it. You know, you can't just make a champion, you've got to have it in you. I needed a goal. That goal would become more champion. That's my focus, to become more champion. Michael never trained his hardest, I don't think, in the gym. You never saw him, you know, he was always relaxed when he was sparring. Never showed any true aggression when he sparred. You know, um, but when he, when, he, when he fought, it was a totally different person. 
The main thing I liked about Michael was that there really was no side to him. What you saw was what you got. He traded punches with some terrific amateurs uh, throughout his, you know, his amateur career. And as a pro, he'd learned his trade in a very old-fashioned way, in a way that's been lost to boxing. Wherever Michael fought, his mum could be seen and heard supporting him from the front row. Go on, son. Go on. Go on. Punch. Jab and move. Jab and move. <laughs> yes. Uppercut. Yeah, I used to back him, yes. I enjoyed boxing. And he's very wrong indeed. And Watson is looking for the finish right here. And Sid Nathan's waved He'd fought guys who were just marginally um, less sharp and less dangerous than him, but at the same time they pushed him. And he just took each fight in his stride and he improved of each fight and he was always learning. And he just wasn't flash. But the big punching is coming from Watson and there's another perfect example of the right hand again. And this time he may not beat the count. Eight, he's done it, up at eight. Really, he was a well-schooled clever, skillful boxer first and foremost. It was a bonus if he hurt somebody and knocked them out. That wasn't Michael's game. Michael's game was picking holes in his opponents and winning cleverly. But being a clever fighter wasn't enough. This was the late 80s. It was the era of flash, hype and the great British middleweights. It was the era of Nigel Benn and Chris Eubank. It was such a fantastic scene with so many good fighters and so many good fights that you tended to take it for granted. This could be a real sensation, a real turn up at the Albert Hall. Anthony Logan, Max Ben up, Ben slips once again. He fights back! And he gets the fantastic play. They were terrific. Ben, Watson, Eubanks. <laughs> Ben was the real exciting fighter who would take on anybody, loved what he called a tear-up. Watson was very underestimated, he was a very talented fighter. Uh, and there was Eubank, who was the real box office, the, the extrovert, the man that everybody wanted to see beaten, certainly the public did. Uh, he brought a tremendous amount to the fight game. It was a good time, it was a good time to see all of these great fighters there. You know, and I think it done a lot for, for young amateurs as well, seeing British guys, you know, up there in the world title ranking. Scary. It was very scary. But then it was about who was willing to step up to the plate and actually, you know, be the person that they said they were. I believe God put Maradona on this earth to score goals, Steve Davis to pop balls, and Nigel Benn to kick ass. So I look at he wants to come forward, he still wants to trade close in. Referee breaks them up. North All of the British middleweights were focused on title glory. Michael Watson, nicknamed the Force, had his eye on Nigel Benn's Commonwealth title. Don't think there was rivalry with Michael, even though he was in my way. I just thought that um, he was just like to me. He was just like two, a goody two shoes, Mike. I never, he never really said nothing bad about anybody. It was mostly said, "Go, oh, Michael, say something bad." Uh, okay, because Michael was just a good guy. I'm more of a classier fighter than Nigel Ben. Um, I'm the sort of fighter I work behind my left hand, and you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm more of a quality fighter than Nigel Ben. I can also punch as well. Would you like to fight Ben? Whenever they can fix the match, I'll be willing. The bout was set for the 21st of May, 1989. Michael would take on Nigel Benn, the Dark Destroyer. Nigel had fought 22 fights and won by 22 knockouts. I guarantee when I see you on the 21st, I said, you ain't gonna have no eyes to look out of, I'm telling you, you are in serious trouble. He was the danger, very ferocious. At the time, he was at his peak. How can this so-called Christian boy go into church fight a dark destroyer like Nigel and all people and people just laugh? Nigel was the dark destroyer meeting the force. It was a gladiator appointment that night. Michael is certainly the betting underdog, uh, Jim, but he's a very talented performer, isn't he? I mean, you couldn't have created a more entertaining fight. Nigel Benn spent something like six hours in a hairdresser's chair on the day of the fight. 
and Michael's playing with his two young children and eating pasta at his mother's council flat. I mean, come on, think about it. So as they're getting in the ring, all these stories circulating about what Michael's done that day and what Nigel's done that day. And of course, the first bell goes, it looks like the roof was going to come off this tent. My game plan against Michael was just going in and blast him out, mate. All guns blazing, no problem whatsoever. I knew for the first four or five, five rounds, I know he weren't going to be hitting me. I know, for, I know that for a fact. I know I was just going to be all over him like a rash. So there you are, those are predicted, those big odds in the first round. It hasn't happened, not yet anyway. And I, I said to all my mates, um, Michael beat Ben. Michael definitely beat Ben. Because one thing I know that Michael's a boxer, Ben's a fighter, and a fighter can't beat a boxer. I told him how to beat Nigel right at the dinner table by letting him use up his own strength. You buy him and tap at him. And when he's getting so fed up that he can't get to you, he'll get some in. But when he finds he can't get to you, you go for him. Oh, now he's starting to take punches, and he's trying to ride away from him. He's not protecting himself, Ben. And it's almost... I had a trainer that didn't really have a game plan because I was strong and powerful. That was it. I could, no, I can do it. Don't need to do nothing else. But Michael was so, so smart. And that's all the confidence that... Uh... Watson's going to eat. He knows he can shake Ben. He knows he can drive him back. When Nigel punched, all Michael did was open his hands and cup them around his head. See, I, I had always covered up like this. That was never effective. I knew it. And only in that fight did Michael show me how to cover up properly, which was to open your hands and cup them and just hold them on top of your head like this and nothing could get through, and that's what happened, and Nigel did punch himself out. I was just waiting till my time occurred. Give a nice tender licks. It looks as though it's going to be a ruling slump there. Which one's going to be first to go? A perfect punch! Got caught in the eye. I'm there, I'm an entertainer. I'm also a winner. I don't like to do something with that coming out on top. I'm doing something I like to come up, come across completely victorious. Oh, he's gone. So, the big hitter has been hit in the sixth round. And the way he backed off from that punch in the eye, it looked as though he wasn't joking. Counted out on his feet there. And I don't think the crowd can believe this. And I know that... It's fully amazing. People can't believe this classified me as being Mike what's his name but Mike what's his name came through big time on the night okay he beat me he's a nice man though that's how I felt he's a nice man got beat by a nice guy you understand that's how I felt now when Chris <laughs> beat me I want to go down down to Hoving look for him man have a street fight outside the ring but but um, with Michael it was different it was different so nice guys don't always come last. Michael's victory raised his profile. Though some sponsorship followed, his lifestyle remained the same. I was just amazed, you know, the first time I met him, I was, gosh, this guy, you know, I couldn't believe how down to earth he was. And he didn't reckon himself at all, not arrogant. And, you know, he even made tea for us. I mean, which other world or Commonwealth champion would do that? Michael was always in tune with the people, his community, and so he, he you know, he never got big-headed. While other champions surrounded themselves with specialists, Michael stayed in Hackney with one expert in his corner. Oh, yes, this is right. Oh, yes, that's a mummy boy. <laughs> that's mummy's boy, all right. Nothing like mummy's food, any. <laughs> Nothing like mummy's food. I just use my own common sense, you know. I'm not a, um, what you call a dietitian, but I use my own common sense because I know the strengthening food. 
a lot of pasta and a lot of fluid Irish moss carrot juice guinea sponge you know mommy strong so sunny strong I come from a very strong family the win against Ben brought Michael professional success surely financial reward would follow but despite fights against Mike McCallum and Errol Christie, Michael was not earning the big money that Chris Eubank and Nigel Benn commanded. He'd beaten Nigel Benn. 18 months later, he was fighting on a Nigel Benn undercard, maybe making 15,000. Nigel Benn was famously making 500,000. How does that work? So he, you know, he gets home that night and looks at, you know, looks at himself in the mirror. He's got the same bruises that you get for a million as you get for five quid. And he's thinking, I've got 15 grand tonight. Nigel Benn, who I beat 18 months ago, is clearing nearly 600. Michael was unhappy with his contract and in 1991 took his promoter manager, Mickey Duff, to court. Michael argued that his contract was a restraint of trade and won the case after the judge agreed that acting both as promoter and manager was a conflict of interest. I think he was, you know, welcomed by many in the boxing community when Michael decided to, you know, take Mickey Duff to court and question the, the conflict of interest which exists between, you know, when, a manager, when someone is a manager and a promoter. Michael's decision, you know, changed that and it was fundamental in bringing about a, a greater awareness for people to have, you know, more input outside the actual the fighting ropes. Now the pressure was on. Michael found himself without a manager, about to face the biggest fight of his life. A world title bout against Chris Eubank, who, like Michael, had beaten Nigel Benn to win the WBO title. But I have to tell you, in the build-up to that fight, Eubank was a massive, massive favourite. It was like watching Big Brother with Chris Eubank. He was in the paper every single day. And suddenly, in wanders from a council estate in Islington, Michael Watson. And straight away, there was the people's champion against the guy we love to hate, the ego. And it was just a fantastic build-up. Michael couldn't understand how anybody thought he could lose to Chris Eubank. You know, he said Eubank's balance is wrong. When, you, when he throws his punches, you can see them coming. Unless he lands the big right hand, the judges won't see what he's doing. I can tuck up, a bit like I did against Nigel Benn, and come on strong. He is good at the boxing. Chris was good, you know, but yet I wanted him to get a good strap in. I expected Michael to give him a lesson in boxing. High drama at Earl's Court. Dodges this way and that is caught again by a sharp looking left jab from Watson. He's kept his boxing together very, very neatly indeed and counted brilliantly at times. Nigel was completely devastating. He really the punching, powerful machine. But Chris, no way in comparison. And he has Eubank on the ribs and fires in two body punches under the head. Watson looks confident now. Eubank revolving around the ring, still quite light on his feet. Lighter now I've troubled Chris one bit. As a matter of fact, I've just been drawing myself far on Chris. He's outboxing, he's outscoring Eubank. Eubank is, frankly, getting a boxing lesson over these last three or four rounds. And there goes the bell to end it. When the final bell went, it was clear to every single person I spoke to in the, in the next 10 minutes that Watson had won clearly by three, four or five rounds. Somebody came to me when the fight was over to congratulate and I remember saying to the person, um, wait until they announce it. The winner and still the WBO champion of the world, Greg Shubin! Well. We are astonished. I'll go so far as to say I think Michael Watson has been plain robbed. That is one of the most controversial decisions I have ever seen. In my view, there is no way that Chris Eubank won that fight. He just went back to his locker room and, you know, he just put his head in his hands and he said, what do I have to do to win? You know, these people are against me. Just an I'm not feeling. I was shocked, absolutely. I did everything right. I couldn't believe no way could I have lost that fight. 
as boxing fear, politics and money. The next day, the press was just outrageous. Some of our most respected newspaper boxing columnists just called it an absolute crying shame and a disgrace. And that's when things got really interesting for Michael Watson. Headlines screamed of the injustice, polls declared Watson the winner, and the public condemned the decision. But Chris Eubank, ever controversial, dared anyone to challenge his right to the belt. I just want to show Michael Watson that this belt belongs to me, it's mine. And it's gonna continue. I'm going to continue to hold this championship for <laughs> as long as I possibly can and the likes of Michael Watson will not take my title. The Eubank was now aggrieved. Because whether you like it or not, Eubank can talk about how much money he likes to make, but he also wants that respect from the people. That respect wasn't there for Chris Eubank and he knew it. The people liked Michael Watson. The people thought that Michael Watson had won that fight. To win a championship, you have to take it. Michael didn't take it. And so the judges threw it uh, my way and gave me the decision. The country went up in arms um, and the rematch was set. The biggest super middleweight title fight Britain had ever seen was set for 21st of September 1991 and the two boxers began their preparation. He lives like a monk. He trains, he'll do his road work in the morning, he'll do five, six miles. He'll go to the gym in the afternoon, he'll do all his training, and then he'll do his sparring as well. So where a man gets up in the morning and goes to work and does eight hours, comes home and all the rest of it, a fighter is doing that just the same. That's his job. You've got to be fully prepared. You know, it's a dangerous sport. And you've got to make sure every time you step into that ring physically, you know, you're at the peak of your condition. If he was 100% focused the first time, he became 120% focused and there was no stopping him. Uh, in his eyes, you could see the passion in his eyes. He was trying a lot harder for the fight. A lot harder. I have never come across anyone with his determination and his self-belief that he will do it and there's nothing coming between him and victory. Mentally and physically, it's what the complete sacrifice. I club myself away from the public. Complete meditation on Chris Eubank. Michael emerges from his training to face Chris Eubank at the press conference for the first time since their controversial fight. Looks like being a cracking affair. <clears throat> Michael couldn't even take his eyes off Eubank. I can remember trying to talk to him, and all he was doing was looking at Eubank. Eubank was angry and would barely pose with Michael in the car park. They were like two magnets, the opposite ends, trying to get closer. They just couldn't do it. They got to within maybe 18 inches, and you could sense the electricity. It would have been hot if you'd put your arm down the middle between their backs. And that was three or four days before the fight, and I realised then that this really was an outrageously personal fight. This was genuine. He didn't like that guy. He wanted what that guy had taken from him. He wanted that title. It's no good being a people's champion. Michael wanted to be a champion. It was fierce. It was ugly. I became the stigma that they said I was. I became the villain. I felt I was the villain. You know, there was no way, you know, I should lose the fight. Because if I did, then I would be cast as the character that they had seen or that the media had pushed, and that wouldn't be right. 11 stone, 13 pounds. I will win. You know, I, I'm a winner. And I, I've proven that many times. I'm, not, I'm a winner outside and I'm a winner inside. And that's, all, that's all that matters. So I thought to Chris Eubank, his image, it completely penciled within my thoughts. I just couldn't get him out of my mind. It haunted me. Just had to beat him to get, get him out of my system. No way will he be doing that to me again. You know, this time, this, this, one, this one was for real. 22,000 fight fans and stars pack the White Hart Lane Stadium to witness the fight of the decade. 
you know, we used Mama Said Knock You Out because that just really summed up the raw energy of, of, of what Michael was about to do in that ring, the excitement of, like, the people's champion entering that ring. Everyone would be screaming his name. You know, he was the greatest. He used the record by LL Cool J called Mama Said Knock You Out. And that, um, and I didn't, and I don't think he had ever used that before. And, um, <laughs> you know, added pressure? You know, how about another half a ton? Just getting warm, just like my out. Michael, Michael, Michael. You can do anything, but you're not knocking me out. I had to walk out of that ring, at least I knew that intrinsically. But actually, it became... It the fight, in the fight, that became the whole point. Just walk out on your feet. You're going to walk out a loser, but walk out at least on your feet. To be battered, I mean literally battered, I was outboxed, outthought, I was outfought. Outmaneuvered, outstrength. Right to the body, then, then the left to the head. Does Watson? I can remember it at the time, thinking it was like those Rocky sequences. You know, when you see a bit of action, and then Mickey's in the corner cutting his eye. It was just like that. It was, it was being played out like a film in front of us. Oh, good right from Watson, and now Eubank is in a bit of trouble on the ropes, and he wants to cover up. He's caught. Oh, and he's staggered by a right. Is Eubank? He regains his senses, but his senses were scrambled, and he's hit by another right from Watson, and another one, and he's down! He's down! He's on the floor, there's 20 seconds to go in the 11th round, and 20,000 people are going absolutely ballistic, you have to understand this. And Michael's in the corner, and he's breathing up, and you can just see, he's glaring. He has never been in this situation before. There's 17 million people watching on TV. You can hear the shrieks of the BBC radio people and the ITV commentators. It's like nothing you've ever seen before. And then we go into serious slow motion. Newbank throws one shot and then time stands still. Michael's heels stay on the floor and his two feet come up. He comes forward and the shock and the power of the punch, the perfect right uppercut to his chin, pulls his feet off the ground slowly and he just goes down straight and he catches the back of his neck on the rope. Michael made it back to his corner. All he had to do was make it through the last round and the world title would be his. Michael was sitting there, he was replying to questions, they were working feverishly just to get him alert, to get him, you know, to get him all fired up, to get as much water on him as possible, and then he stands up, and the bell goes, and knew then that there was something wrong. When he came out to touch gloves for the 12th round, that wasn't him, that wasn't Michael, he's not there. From there he wasn't boxing at all. He was fatally hurt from the 11th round when he was on the rope. He should not have come out for the 12th round. I spoke to Michael, I said, shake hands. He said, no, but we touched clubs. And then they started boxing, and then Michael backed into the corner when I believe he was stuck on the second rope at that time. And Chris was throwing everything at him, at him. And that's when I knew something was wrong, and, that, and that's when I stopped it. Well, I've been through this stage with Nigel, when I got this weather the storm. I'm the champion, last round. I couldn't believe my referee stepped into the fight. He wouldn't have to me. It doesn't matter what Eubank had done in that round. If he'd have come out and tickled Michael's nose with a feather, the damage was done at that point. And nobody could have known that. Nobody at all. He didn't put me down, did he? And then when I went back to the rock, then I collapsed. Then I sat down and I couldn't believe what happened. It's a shock for all. I was just, I was just fainted, just collapsed. Discouragement, I felt thrill after everything I've done, they just taken the belt away from me. That, you know, Michael was not gonna stop that fight. And when he went down on the floor, like, we, we all had to get into the ring to make sure he was okay. But when he was down and out like that, it was obvious something was very, very wrong. Well, I think, still think Michael had won the fight, you know? 
And when I see everybody running in the ring and thing, all I want to do is to see that Michael was all right. The, the ringside doctor, I mean, that was just crazy. He had, like, no equipment. Um, he got his suitcase and put that under Michael's head. He had a torch, was looking at Michael's eye, and you could tell something was very wrong at that stage. It wasn't just a straight knockout. Things, things weren't right. I didn't... I always thought he'd be OK. I, I never knew, you know. I thought, so what if he's lost this, you know, but I, yeah. I didn't think... Wait, it, the thing is, also, you'd think that he'd be OK, you know. Medics around ringside, um, facilities, you know, two minutes, uh, you know, this is England. This is not a third world yeah. country. These are anxious moments for the Commonwealth middleweight champion because he has got medical attention in here now and people are being cleared out of the ring and this is dreadful to see after such a memorable contest. Nobody knew where to go. It was, it was just so crazy because we was running with the stretcher towards the exit but we didn't know where the ambulances were. There was no one to tell us. Uh, and the doctor shouted over there, and there was like these two ambulances there. We went in the back of that, and we set off. Now, the, the driver of the ambulance said, where to? D didn't even know where to go. You know, the doctor was just looking in his eye the whole time, uh, and you could tell from what, you know, the doctor's expression, it wasn't good. I remember just sitting down in the ambulance, just, just like looking up and seeing the, the blue flashing light go around at the top, and just thinking, you know, th you know this, is, this is it. This is, you know, what it's all come down to now. The ambulance eventually arrived at North Middlesex Hospital from White Hart Lane. By that time, Michael's brain had been starved of oxygen for over 30 minutes. The hospital said, this is the wrong hospital, we can't treat Michael. You need to go to, you know, to a hospital which specialises in, you know, injury to the brain. Another trip across London to St Bart's Hospital. Michael finally goes into theatre two hours after the fight was stopped. And when we got to Bart, it was only then we realised how serious it was. I, I think there was a lot of concern that Michael might not be able to fight again. But then people started to realise that Michael might not live. Michael had suffered an acute subdural haemorrhage, a blood clot on the surface of the brain that left him in a coma. The injury was sustained in the 11th round by Eubank's punch and the impact of Michael's head hitting the ropes. He had two procedures in the early hours following the injury to remove blood clots from the brain and then went on to have a variety of other procedures aimed at keeping the pressure inside the skull down and then draining excess fluid from the brain. To be honest with you, it was such a shock. I don't even remember what they told me because it was like I was in a different world. You know, I was in a different world. I was in a state of shock. Mm. It was madness for us. I mean, one minute he's on top of the world, the next minute he's fighting for his life. And you just have to live minute by minute. That's all, you know. You just, not even that, you live second by second, you know. Um, hoping that another clot doesn't develop, hoping that another difficulty doesn't arise. Michael had a, a, a large bandage, blood smeared bandage around his head and um, scrawled on it was no bone flap. And I just never forget that, it was bloody, bloody finger marks from gloves. It really struck me then just how serious this had been. You, know, you can't suddenly start playing this guy, you know, Westlife tapes. This is the real world, this. This is the real thing. This is a, a guy who should be dead. That was sad. Seeing someone that who trained so long and had so hard to be world champion, the next minute he's lying on the bed wires and everything, I think bit of his skull out. That was sad. Guilty feelings abounded after the fight. Roy Francis, the referee, speaks about the aftermath for the first time. We all know what happened. I don't want to dwell on that. Um, I did my job. Uh, I, I'd never want to bring back the, well, 
the feelings I had for the next fortnight, I'd never want them again. I had uh, maimed uh, somebody's son. That was um, that wasn't good for me. To actually have caused this accident, or to be a part of the accident, I should say, wasn't good. It wasn't good for me. As the British boxing establishment tried to cope with Michael's condition, he received a visit from one of his boxing heroes. Muhammad Ali came, and that was a big boost as well. You know, to see him face to face, because I love him. You know, I used to, I love Muhammad Ali. When Muhammad Ali came in, um, you know, we were all, yeah. For wow. Like, you know, he is my, <laughs> he is my idol of all time. And, you know, he was in the same room as us. And then when Michael saw him, his, you know, he, he'd obviously, he was down sometimes, so when he saw him, his eyes just lit up. I can, I can remember his words as if, as, if, as if it was yesterday. He looked at me just like what just like I'm looking at you. He said to me, he says, you're the man. You're a man. It's a Michael Watson. I, mm, I, caught, I still couldn't smile. I said, do you know something? You, you're nearly as good looking as me. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's such a he really he really does a great character. I say something. The first time a smile broke out my face, I was broke, I just started laughing. Ever since that day, I broke from my barrier. Michael had always been a fighter. He would now have to summon the same strength and determination that made him Commonwealth champion to fight his way back to health. As brain damage had left him paralyzed with no control over his body. Michael's physical state when, you, when I first started to look, look after him, um, he was really weak, couldn't, couldn't talk. The only way he could communicate was either through blinking his eyes or moving his fingers, yes and no. Do you know where you are, Michael? Give me a nod if you know where you are. There was no m mobility, he couldn't move his hands, couldn't move his, his legs. You know, it was, it was pretty, pretty, you know, hard to, to bear to see that a man has lost so much, you know, um, through an accident like that. To think how fit he was, you know, reduced to, to somebody who's lost, lost everything. The Michael that I knew, that was a Michael. Michael couldn't hold his head up. He's in a wheelchair. And the dribbling and everything like a baby. You're still having problems with dribbling at the moment, are you? I have a big appetite. <laughs> a big appetite, I know you have. You know, you have to feed him with the straw, you have to, to give him anything for him to swallow, you have to rub his jaw to try to see if he could swallow. You know, it, it, it is hard. It's, all I can say is just horrible. Especially when you, you when you understand mentally what's going down, but you can't you, you cannot um, respond physically. It's horrible. The mind healed, but the body's not. It's terrible. I used to put my my head through the armhole. Right, it was terrible. It's really frustrating. Somehow I wasn't jumping. See, I, I just got to distinguish what's right. I'll put my head through. Now eventually I got, I got through to write hard to put my head through. Just all mental stimulation really. So a lot about sure everything came together. 
There was many times when Michael felt a little bit doubtful. You wouldn't give as much. And there were the days where you kind of like be thinking about the change, you know. Um, but in, in it all, he still carried on, he still pursued. Well, Michael's a fighter. Um, and I always remember Michael saying, Suzanne, no pain, no gain, you know, because I, I remember the times when we were trying to stretch his leg or trying to stand him while, come on, Michael, is it hurting you? And I used to hurt for him, you know, <laughs> and he used to say to me, Suzanne, no pain, no gain. After almost two years of intensive physio and speech therapy, Michael was able to go home. He recovered from a more severe head injury than I've uh, seen anyone else uh, get through. His recovery in terms of both his mental and physical functions has been equally remarkable. Uh, and I think that really is a testament to his determination. What day is it today? A lifelong Arsenal supporter, Michael's friends organised a charity event at Highbury to raise money for his long-term care. Michael believed that the British Boxing Board of Control had failed to protect him by not providing adequate medical care at ringside on the night, and he decided to sue them for negligence. It was quite a mixed reaction, really, because a lot of people were worried that, like, if the board were or, or did fold, you know, boxing would cease because there would be nobody to actually administer it. But I think it was a very brave move from Michael, and I think he got a lot of support from a lot of people because, you know, if they were negligent, they should, you know, pay th or, or pay the price. And, um, you know, unfortunately, that negligence left Michael in the situation which he is today. The boxing balls, <sighs> not really looking out for the boxers' interest, maybe themselves. And it's nice that Michael's made a stand and good luck to him because he's got a future and he's going to need the money because all him, the money that he's written bought him for the boxing board over the years, what has he got back? Nothing. Eight years after the fight, the High Court found the British Boxing Board of Control to have been negligent in not providing appropriate resuscitation equipment at ringside and doctors properly qualified to use it. The board were instructed to pay Michael damages payment of which has yet to be settled. What happened to Michael Watson showed that there was a lot of uh, inadequacies in, in the British Boxing Board of Control and their, and their medical procedures. And, and obviously the main thing was, has been shown, getting oxygen to the boxer as soon as he's collapsed. And that was, didn't happen in the Michael Watson case. Since the, the Watson fight, and since you know Michael suffered those terrible injuries, I think boxing has become a lot safer because they have you know clearly identified paramedics, they have oxygen by the ringside, they have designated ambulances to go to a designated hospital which deals with injuries to the brain. Certainly, four or five of the seven or eight people that have had uh, subdural hemorrhages since then would have probably died if the safety regulations that were introduced rapidly after Michael Watson's um, nearly fatal final fight hadn't been introduced. Michael's injury certainly made boxing safer, and although it ended his career, he isn't bitter. He has a strong belief that his life is in the hands of God. I can believe he's recovering. Yeah, because he's, he's a man who's got a strong faith and he's got a strong belief in God. And I think that's really helped him in this whole of this process. And so, yeah, it has been, it has been amazing. It has been a miracle, you know, to many people as a testimony how, you know, he's managed to regain all of his mobility. really a, a bad point of you know life or death and, and for him to be standing up and you know I think that's just through his faith and determination and really shows the type of character that he is.
said about thanking you. Thanking you ever so much, Father, for yes. life. Yes. Life, yes. eternal life. Yes. yes. Give me great hope we can be fully assured yes. that we have life to, to look forward to. Father, Ten years after the fight, a Michael has healed both physically and emotionally and is now ready to meet publicly with Chris Eubank for the first time. There are people who say the best fight ever seen in the British ring is Nigel Ben Chris Eubank won in 1990. That's not true. That's not true. Michael Watson Chris Eubank too has been the best fight ever seen in the British ring. You know, in every regard, Michael showed what this game was about up until the 11th round. Um, total resolve, total conviction, total application of the art. I believe I will have flashbacks on, on the way things used to be before the fight. It will be hard, but at the same time, I want them to see the transformation and what God has done throughout my life and for me to express forgiveness to him. I want him to, I want Chris to see the transformation deep within me. That's where it's at. I give God thanks that the both can get together. And Michael is not carrying any feeling for Chris, because he said it, you know, and because it could happen either way, you know, and to let Chris know that there is no feeling against him. No, I, I feel completely different to this man. I've prayed that I've been for this man for such a long time. I've been praying for you. I've been praying for you, Chris. You're forgiven. This can happen to anyone. Mm. Well, God bless you with such great ability in entertaining the public. Mm. Unfortunately, an accident has happened. Mm. Well, it, it brings a lot, lot of uh, memories in regards to things which have been said to me and in regards to what happened and, you know, the... Uh... People have downfalls in life. But yeah. well, that's not where it's at. Life must go on. It was total. The, his victory was... I mean, after the fight, I remember saying to the press that he, you know, this is the only man who's beaten me to date. Just because I've got the decision doesn't really mean that I won. This is a, a guy who should be dead. You know, he is the boxer who came back from the dead. That remains an absolute established medical fact. He should not have made any recovery, according to all of the medical experts that have ever peered inside his head. I'm there, I'm an entertainer. I'm also a winner. I'd like to do something with that coming out on top. I'm doing something I'd like to come, up, come across completely. Victorious. If you want to talk to Michael Watson, he's now online at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash sport. After yourself. Uncle Joe took him to the Crown and Manor, a local gym bursting with young boxing hopefuls. For Michael, it was a safe haven away from the harsh realities of East London life. I wanted to make him a man and not just a cry man. And he, he came up and I noticed that there was something in him. To Michael, the gym felt like home the moment he stepped inside. Seeing the punch bag for the first time, looking at boxing gloves for the first time, it was truly extraordinary. I just couldn't get, get I just couldn't wait to put my hands through them. Just get, just to go and smell 
smell the leather of the bags. It's truly amazing. Things were coming out gently. Things were coming out, you know, as he got confident, his natural ability started to show. He had good wing craft, he had a good thinking brain, nice jab, good left hook. Um, yeah, everything clicked. In, in time, everything clicked together. Boxing was me. I was in complete control. Can, it was only after a few weeks, I, be, I became the top man in the club. It wasn't long before Michael stepped into the ring. And as a promising junior, he started to win. Boxing, it takes years and years of hard work. You know, it's not something which you actually can go to the gym and train for, you know, two or three weeks or two and three months. It's a, it's a sacrifice you've got to make over a period of time. From 15, 16, you know, your, your uh, ultimate ambition is to become a champion, but it's a, a long process. It takes a lot of time, a lot of dedication, and a lot of pepper. I believe God put Maradona on this earth, score goals, Steve Davis to pop balls, and Nigel Ben to kick ass. So I look at it. All of the British middleweights were focused on title glory. Michael Watson, nicknamed the Force, had his eye on Nigel Benn's Commonwealth title. Don't think there was rivalry with Michael, even though he was in my way. I just thought that um, he was just like to me. He was just like a goody two shoes, Michael. I never, he never really said nothing bad about anybody. It was mostly said, "Go, on, Michael, say something bad." Uh, okay, because Michael was just a good guy. I'm more of a classier fighter than Nigel Ben. Um, I'm the sort of fighter I work behind my left hand, and you know I'm, I'm, a, I'm more of a quality fighter than Nigel Ben. I can also punch as well. Would you like to fight Ben? Whenever they can fix the match, I'll be willing. The bout was set for the 21st of May, 1989. Michael would take on Nigel Ben, the Dark Destroyer. Nigel had fought 22 fights and won by 22 knockouts. I guarantee when I see you on the 21st, I said, you ain't gonna have no eyes to look out of. I'm telling you, you are in serious trouble. He was a danger, very ferocious. At a time, he was at his peak. How can this so-called Christian boy go into church, fight a dark destroyer like Nigel Man of all people, and people just laugh? Nigel was the dark destroyer meeting the force. It was a gladiator's appointment that night. Michael is certainly the betting underdog, uh, Jim, but he's a very talented performer. In a quest to become world champion, Michael Watson's fight with Chris Eubank rocked the boxing world. The pressure of that fight, going into that fight, was immense. Immense. It was fierce. It was ugly. He wanted that title. It's no good being a people's champion. Michael wanted to be a champion. That's my focus, to become more champion. The most controversial fight ever seen in a British ring left Michael Watson fighting for life. This is his story. Dalston is home to one of London's biggest black communities. Sandwiched between trendy Islington and hard-nosed Hackney, it wasn't an easy place to grow up in, particularly if you were a quiet boy like Michael Watson. Michael wasn't always tough. He used to cry too easily, and I couldn't allow him to grow up like that. No way. Michael was very quiet, very shy, you know, so we have to break him, you, I would say break him in, you know. Yes, he was very, very quiet. Naturally shy, Michael found it difficult to cope with life on the rough and ready de Beauvoir estate and soon fell victim to the local bully. Some boy, I don't remember the name, used to beat him up, you know, bullied him. And I always tell him, help yourself, because I can't go and fight for you, so you have to defend yourself. It got to a point where he just went home crying, 
And then his uncle said, that's enough's enough, you need to learn to box, you need to learn to look hard. He pushed him and he just took each fight in his stride and he improved of each fight and he was always learning and he just wasn't flash. But the big punching is coming from Watson and there's another perfect example, the right hand again. And this time he may not beat the count. Eight, he's done it, up at eight. Really, he was a well-schooled, clever, skillful boxer, first and foremost. It was a bonus if he hurt somebody and knocked them out. That wasn't Michael's game. Michael's game was picking holes in his opponents and winning cleverly. But being a clever fighter wasn't enough. This was the late 80s. It was the era of flash, hype and the great British middleweights. It was the era of Nigel Benn and Chris Eubank. It was such a fantastic scene with so many good fighters and so many good fights that you tended to take it for granted. This could be a real sensation, a real turn up at the Albert Hall. Anthony Logan, Max Ben up, Ben slips once again, he fights back! And he catches the ball. Fantastic! They were terrific. Ben, Watson, Eubanks. <laughs> ben was the real exciting fighter who would take on anybody. Loved what he called a tear-up. Watson was very underestimated. He was a very talented fighter. Uh, and there was Eubank, who was the real box office, the, the extrovert, the man that everybody wanted to see beaten. Certainly the public did. Uh, he brought a tremendous amount to the fight game. It was a good time. It was a good time to see all of these great fighters there. You know, and I think it done a lot for, for young amateurs as well seeing British guys, you know, up there in the world title ranking. Scary, it was very scary. But then it was about who was willing to step up to the plate and actually, you know, be the person that they said they were. Michael was at the gym three times a week and running six miles a day. By 1984, he moved up the ranks to fight in the Amateur Boxing Association Championships. Having failed to make the finals, Michael decided to leave the amateurs behind and turn professional. There's, I would say, only a percentage of maybe two or three percent that actually make it. You know, you can't just make a champion, you've got to have it in you. I needed a goal. That goal would become more champion. That's my focus, to become more champion. Michael never trained his hardest, I don't think, in the gym. You never saw him, you know, he was always relaxed when he was sparring. Never showed any true aggression when he sparred. You know, um, but when he, when, he, when he fought, it was a totally different person. The main thing I liked about Michael was that there really was no side to him. What you saw was what you got. He traded punches with some terrific amateurs uh, throughout his, you know, his amateur career. And as a pro, he'd learned his trade in a very old-fashioned way, in a way that's been lost to boxing. Wherever Michael fought, his mum could be seen and heard supporting him from the front row. Go on, son. Go on. Go on. Punch. Jab and move. Jab and move. <laughs> Yes, uppercut. Yeah, I used to back him, yes. I enjoyed boxing. And he's very rocky indeed. And Watson is looking for the finish right here. And Sid Nathan's waving. He'd fought guys who were just marginally um, less sharp and less dangerous than him, but at the same time, they